Hey, what's up everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. So we're going to get into uh, some really cool topics today about how to max out your ROI, not with just with Google AdWords, but just lead generation in general. We're also going to talk about some issues that are coming down with uh, with lawsuits. Uh, if you call anybody's mobile number from like an automated device, we're going to get into some of that so you know exactly uh, what the guidelines are and what you as an agent should do to avoid uh, being sued for everything that you are worth. Uh, so that's a very, very important thing that we're going to talk about today. So before we get to that, I just wanted to uh, thank you for watching live if you're doing that. But if you're watching the replay on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe or go over to iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to the audio episodes or the versions that are there. That way you get us nestled right here in your ears where we so, so belong, right, Greg? Nestled so deep, Matt. That's right. So the junior grand master himself. <laughs> right. That's not creepy at all, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> and most people, their skin just started crawling. They're like, yeah. gick, 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 gick. why does as, he do that as well, as well they should. All right, so uh, <laughs> we've got two two special guests with us. Paul Campbell, who was with us about three weeks ago, I think. Paul, what's up today? What's going on, guys? Not much. But, uh, We're excited to have you back. Be back. That's right. And then we have another special guest, Chris Tam from the Denver area. Chris, what's up today? Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's exciting, man. We're going to get in some really cool stuff here. So, um, so people... Uh, might be familiar with Paul from your last appearance, but Paul, refresh people's memory on kind of where you're at and what your main thing is. Oh, man, no main thing, lots of little things. Uh, <laughs> all real estate related, Portland, Oregon market. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the bridge version. We, yep. we have our small brokerage, and we do a lot of investment stuff, and obviously we work a lot of lead gen with Chris and, uh, you know, historically anybody we can find uh, for our real estate company. So. Yeah, and that's how this uh, this episode came about. So Paul introduced us to Chris. So Chris is the man when it comes to analytics tracking and really understanding what works uh, for online lead generation, which is why we're excited to talk to him. So Chris, where are you at? And kind of give us a 60-second bio version on who you are, where you are, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I was in residential real estate for four years. My background is more in the corporate America. Um, in real estate, I started a title company, helped start two mortgage brokerages, closed about 400 transactions a year, just traditional resale, no bank or builder business. Um, and then uh, partnered with our account, the person that runs our account management company is Gabe Cordova. He closed about 800 transactions a year. But I started Firepoint about three, four years ago. I hired somebody to run it for a couple years, and then it actually became too much. And I sold everything I had in the real estate business and all those interests and and went over to Firepoint full time, so I've been running that for about three years now. Very cool. Yeah, and so that's the, so the stuff we're going to get into. We're going to talk about um, so Google and AdWords and you know Facebook Legion, all this stuff. I mean, this comes from you actually being on the ground doing it for yourself. And like Paul, when he's kind of introduced us, this all comes from you kind of tweaking the back end of all this stuff, all the systems that were out there at the time, and then essentially building something for yourself just to, uh, I guess, probably improve the sanity so that you can sleep at night <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> and have something that works for you, right, Chris? Yeah, and it was actually something um, I in different careers, different companies, I participated in four different build outs of different CRM systems. This is actually the fifth one. Oh, wow. Um, this is in real estate now, though. And so it was, it was from the things that we couldn't do, we had built to run our company. And it, it, it's amazing kind of when you can answer any question you can dream of asking. You can actually grow a lot faster, sleep a few more minutes each night, and you can actually do your business a little differently. But most people in real estate, in real estate are constrained by what they have to do inside of a system. So we have these questions, but we give them up pretty quickly so we know we can't answer them. Hmm, interesting. All right. So let's uh, let's dive into the whole lawsuit thing and, and what our guidelines are now or, or what they're becoming in terms of um, – well, fill us in, first of all, on the – we talked about a little bit about this before we hit record or before we went on the air, but what's the deal with the lawsuits that are coming down and what are they doing that's, that's causing the lawsuits to be triggered against them? Sure. Um, so TCPA, uh, super exciting. It's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. Uh, it's a massive law, but the big thing is there was a redefinition of it in October of 2013 and of June of 2015. So the biggest redefinition that happened in 2015 basically said that um, it's all about mobile privacy. If you're going to call somebody or contact them on a mobile number, so if you're going to text message them or if you're going to call them, and it's all about automation. So if you're going to use an automated system to do that, if you're calling from an auto dialer, if you're sending an automated text, and even if you're not sending an automated text or using the auto dialer, if your system can auto dial, you're still subject to TCPA. So if you're not calling mobile numbers, if you're not using any system that can auto dial, if you're not auto texting, you don't have to care. You can call anybody on the mobile phone individually, you can text them individually, no problem at all. 
If you do use an automated system or you fall under TCPA, it's $16,000 fine per phone call, per text message, if you don't have prior written consent for every single person that you call. So again, if you have prior written consent to call them, to text them, you don't have to worry about it. You're legal under the law. But what happens is, and if you want to go through a list of lawsuits, um, there's an insurance agent that has got a $3 million fine for 185 mm -hmm. phone calls he made in one day from a auto dialer. I mean, it's why um, what Gary Keller said at the last uh, big meeting that you have to stop using auto dialers if you're circle prospecting because how do you know if you're not calling a mobile phone number? There's websites that teach you how to sue telemarketers. Um, there's all kinds of things. Omaha Steaks just got a $10 million fine for phone calls they made seven years ago, and now that the law was redefined, now they're getting the fine for it. And there's 20 to 30 percent attorney's fees tacked onto these things, so it's a huge ambulance chasing. So if anybody uh, believes or doesn't believe it, all you have to do is Google TCPA auto dialing law and you'll see it all I mean we have the 135 page report interpretations of it it's a pretty scary thing that most people in real estate don't care about but anybody in lending is scared crapless over it, and they're basically outlawing auto texting auto dialers all these different things because they don't want the liability as a company I'm yeah, scared they've, shitless they've got I gotta tell you one thing I've done my grown up doing calls right I mean that's yeah what absolutely I do. and it, it, you are scaring the fucking shit out of me right now just yeah, to be you keep honest. the liability. Like you keep the liability. So Christ. for all we know, we have millions. And I did the same thing. I've used an auto dialer in the past. And did I know I was doing it illegally? Does that actually hold? I mean, call the FC and ask them and find out. But it's there, and it's a very big <laughs> yeah, thing. You definitely want to get on their radar as quickly as possible, Greg. So you get on that. Um, <laughs> but I have so I have two takeaways from that. So number one is. Um, so let's say if you're starting off and you have a a small database. It, it seems like the government is. What, regardless of their intentions, they're kind of forcing us back into an area where the way that, that business used to be done, which is based on personal relationships, introductions, marketing, referrals, yada yada, uh, is being forced to become the norm again. Which I, you know, I mean, we have the leverage of technology, so there's other ways that we can build business. So I'm, I mean, I'm fine with the overall concept of that. Uh, but the other thing is, if you're approaching it from a team perspective. We there. I mean, we're talking about guys that have databases in the tens of thousands. Theoretically, anybody that's in that database, they already have existing permission to call. Is that right? No, there's no prior business exemption either. That was limited really? in 2013. So if you just Google TCPA prior business exemption, if you didn't get written permission to call them from an auto dialer, even if you did business with them, you don't have permission. Now there's still ways around it. If you use click to call, if you single call. Um, if you're just calling for a regular phone, those are all completely legal. You don't have to have permission at all. They're just trying to protect people's mobile privacy against automated systems from telemarketers that don't have permission to do it. So even if you're using an auto dialer, if you if all of those were registration leads where they agreed to be called from an auto dialer, you're totally okay. They gave the permission, but the burden of proof is on you to prove that to the FCC if they ever come after you. And if there was a team that you really didn't like and their name got turned into the FCC, I mean that's on their burden of proof to prove they made all those calls with permission. Wait, did you just suggest that I can throw other people in my yard? No, market? I did not suggest So, so how can they go? Let's say someone does thousands of phone calls using an auto, auto dialer, yeah. right? Now, can they go subpoena the auto dialer oh, to with, extract all the numbers? So, let's say someone does 10,000 phone calls, then they're going to do $16,000 times 10,000, you know, quadrillion is going to be your number. Dollars. Yeah. Fuck me, dude. That's a slobbity jillion yeah. dollars. It's, but it's only it's only mobile phone numbers. It's only if you didn't have consent. So they have to go through and verify which ones are home, which ones are mobile. And there are systems out there that are TCPA compliant with an auto dialer, um, which is insane. But literally, like it'll it'll dial regular numbers. Then when it hits a mobile number, it'll verify it. It'll stop. You have to click to call that one. It'll go back and auto dial the two. Like it's but those are for oh, massive wow. operations. So Dish Network got a five and a half billion dollar fine, and it already granted summary judgment. Just Google five and a half billion dollar. Dish Network fine, and it's going to be this big. It'll be interesting to see will the TCPA actually take Dish Network down because of that, or are they going to find some kind of settlement with it? Right. Really? Yeah, why? Yeah. Why are they so anal about this? What, I mean, who, what bug crawl up whose butt to make this such a massive <laughs> you know, issue? It's the, the head last, of the consumer effort, yeah. yeah. It's the last bastion of personal privacy into our lives that we carry with us everywhere we go, and that was the and that was the whole idea. But this stuff didn't exist in 1991 when the law was passed. I mean, mobile phones did. Um, but now they're just redefining it to be more applicable to how technology works today. Yeah, I mean, okay, so here's an example. I keep getting some call that's always changing on this, right? Turn them in. Who's going for blood? Yeah, let's get them, kill them. The mob mentality at its best right there. No, but the money goes to you. That's the difference. The money is yours. 
Absolutely. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. Right the FCC gives summary forward. judgment. I mean, the FCC, the whole thing is it's not just fines to them. It gives punitive damages to you. You turn them in. I'm violated. I feel violated. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I feel I, violated in the worst possible way. Like, I'll send you, <laughs> I can send you the link after this on how to sue them, and the payment actually comes to you. The attorney gets paid, the FCC gets their fine, and then you get the penalties and damages for it. Wow. Oh, that works on text messages too, right? Yep, I'm going to need that article too. I've yep. got a couple of nasty people that have been text messaging me. <laughs> Business opportunities. Your brother-in-law does not count, okay? You can't turn oh, him in. in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, so, so Chris, I don't know if you've seen this, but I was uh, there's, there's somebody that's advertising on Facebook about how if you're not doing automated texting in your business, you're an idiot because they're, they're sending out like 2,500 automated texts per day and building their business off this, and they're selling an info product about how they're doing oh, this. Oh, my gosh. Is that is that just the ultimate in stupidity right now? Not necessarily. So the liability is not on the person that does it. It's on the person that hired the person that does it. So if you hire a call center and you know they're using it, the liability is on you for hiring that call center. The oh. liability is not on the person that's necessarily doing it. It's on the person that engaged somebody to do it. So liability is on the software side. Like our attorneys actually said we can't touch it because they don't know if the FCC is ever going to turn their guns on vendors that didn't regulate it properly. So we just stay away from that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, well, just they're teaching let's, let's it. Just ask yourself a question. Who has the money? Nobody. That's the, wherever that is, the government will eventually come for you. Absolutely. And so at the end of the day, just because I'm teaching you how to shoot a gun, I'm not telling you who to shoot. I didn't shoot him for you. I built the gun. Yeah, same thing. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. That is honestly Would scary. Would be a bad time to say that this is one of the reasons why I've become so interested in FirePoint is because I didn't have <laughs> a fine and FirePoint compliant. So, are you guys taking new registrations? Because I'll be on your next registration. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, All right, so, quick, quickly, what's the click to call? So, what's how does that separate from the auto dialer? How does the average agent? What do, what do they take away from this conversation? Absolutely. So the idea of sales automation is how do you do things quickly in sales and do it compliantly. So um, you look at the idea of inside sales with Salesforce. Inside, and it's not who we are, any of that stuff. But inside sales is the largest dialer with the largest CRM in the entire world. And what they do is they have no auto dialing capability. All you do, can do is click to call. So you click a record, you make the call, you click next, you make the call, you click next, you make the call. But it keeps you 100% compliant because it's called manual human intervention per call. You're actually clicking to accept, you're clicking to hang up, you're clicking the next one. You can still auto drop voicemails and things like that, but it's not auto dialing for you. There's no auto capability, so it's not TCPA compliant. An important piece of TCPA, it says, again, super exciting stuff, but even if you were using an auto dialer, but you were clicking to call, the system still considered an auto dialer because it can auto dial. So it actually, you can't even have the ability to auto dial, even if you're not using it, you still have to comply with the law. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and so, so the point of that, Paul, thank you for jumping in, is that uh, so FirePoint has that click-to-call capability within it, right? Yeah, we intentionally did everything, so it's TCPA compliant. So if you send out, same thing, if you send out text messages that are, uh, you send a text message at day two and day four, and they're automated, or mass texting, or sly dial, or sly dial broadcast, if you're touching a mobile number with something automated and you don't have written permission to do it, it falls under TCPA. Okay. Now that's, that does not count your, if you're smart enough to have uh, like text drip sequences that people opt into. If uh, they opt in. About, we're talking about permission. pushing, not pulling. 100%. Yeah. Yep, if okay. you have All the right. permission to do it, you're totally clear. Yeah. Well, right. I just need to go change my shorts now. Because, <laughs> yeah. holy shit. Man. I'm not wearing shorts. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Stay down. Do not stand up from that desk. <laughs> oh. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I'm adding this to my listing agreements that we have uh, their permission to uh, text them anytime we want. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so so w let's, 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 I want to back up here really, really quickly with the TCPA a little bit more on these auto dialers. Are, are, are they... Going after big and small, does it matter the size? Are they, are they just, I mean, because a lot of the big banks and big people that I'm getting harassed by, which next time I get one of those fucking messages, I'm going to go after them because I want billions of dollars. And that's my, that's how I'm going to get my $650 million net worth. That's where it's just, I'm going to screw yeah. someone over. Yay. If they broke the law, you're holding them honest. There you go. <laughs> That's just a fine fucking someone over. <laughs> well, I mean, Chris gave the example of that. That one guy was just a regular insurance broker that made oh, yeah. cold call for one day, right? So I mean, there's so, a, so somebody turned him in. He pissed somebody off. They turned him in, and the government just decided to go after that specific person, right? Yeah, there's a DVD store owner. If you just Google $1.7 trillion TCPA fine, just Google that. There's a $1.7 trillion fine for calls that were made, kind of like Circle Prospect, letting people know in an area about his stores. And the FCC is saying they're probably just going to settle for his entire net worth so he can't pay $1.7 trillion. Uh, but the idea is there's people that made 185 phone calls. That's $3 million of the fines. Then there's um, 
Omaha Steaks, a $10 million fine. There's a $5 billion fine. They're all over the place. And it's a big, I was actually on a compliance call with uh, national compliance for a lending company before this. And literally TCPA was brought up on that call of are we TCPA compliant? How are we TCPA compliant? Because they can't allow any type of automated mobile uh, contact with their loan officers. Okay. As, as an organization with their own loan officers? Yeah, so what in, happens is... In the context is of their own business? They use FirePoint, and so they have to make sure if they're going to use FirePoint, they have to make sure it's, TCP, it's TCPA compliant for them to use. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Let's talk, right. let's, talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about this because I'm not messing around, man. I mm -hmm. will be hiring you. Um, because I've been doing... Uh, let me put it this way, and I'm not going to self-incriminate here, sure. but I may or may <laughs> not know somebody... Absolutely. ...may or may not have been using one of these the products that you, you, you may have brought up on today's show. Yeah, Is and I may or may not have used an auto dialer in the past to circle prospect and to call leads that I don't have proof that they registered and gave that permission from another lead source I may or may not have bought leads for. And at the end of the day, the reality is, and it's one of those, if you have any questions, if it's valid or not, all, it's one phone call to your attorney just to say, is TCPA something I should be concerned about if I did A, B, and C, and you will get a yes. I mean, you don't have to trust me with it. It's a liability out there. And the question is, are you okay doing something today that may give you $5 million in fines mm -mm. two years from now, mm -mm. and if you're not okay with that, you stop it today. And that's why oh, yeah. It's stopping. Oh, I, I, I have, without knowing, mm -hmm. preferencing that, been doing something that has been incredibly profitable for our team. Absolutely. But now ha hearing this, I am cutting ties with that product as of this very second. I am not going to put my team at that type. That is honestly beyond scary. Uh, and any of you guys are out there, I know there's a, Matt, you and I have a friend that was talking about something that, you know, Chris has been talking about on a very public forum. And we are going to remind this individual of this conversation, have him go watch this podcast so he will know to sh zip it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's All just right. it's it's a scary thing and it's one of those that you have to get your own grasp. I mean, it's the idea of like can spam saying you can't spam email, but with that there's not fines behind it like this. This is a very public find process where the people that were damaged that got the calls get money, attorneys get money, and the FCC gets money. And when attorneys start getting money from things, it entices people. I mean, the App Store just had yeah. two apps delisted. They pulled them down where it was actually, if you just look at TCPA reporting apps on the App Store, you'll see the articles about them. And they were only there. So when you got a call from somebody that you think was a telemarketer, you'd press a button, it would send it to an attorney firm, and then they would ambulance chase and try and get you money from it because they get attorney fees out of that. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to be the antidote here. How, so let's talk about you guys and how you're going to make me millions of dollars. Let's go. Okay. So, <laughs> biggest question I, I would ask, and this, is, this isn't a question about FirePoint. This is a question about you and running a business, is if anybody ever says, this really isn't a question, it's a soapbox, but it'll turn into a question. Um, if anybody ever says, I spent $1,000 on X last month and it made me $2,000 on X last month, that statement means nothing. We didn't get those leads last month. We got them last year, two years ago, three years ago. And if you tell me that you made $300,000 or you made a 6 to 1 ROI, that means nothing. If you don't put time into a money equation, like, oh, I made $300,000, what, in a week, in a year, in a lifetime, or I have a 6 to 1 ROI, personally, I would rather have a 2 to 1 return on investment on something that turns every 90 days than a 6 to 1 return on investment than something that turns every 12 months. And so when you talk about, like, every in real estate talks about these ideas in lead generation, you're sending a newsletter, you're sending a thank you card, um, or you're buying a lead online, whatever that is, or you have a telemarketer you hired, that's money you're spending. If you don't have the return, the cash, with the time it took to convert, it means nothing. Because somebody says, I made a 6 to 1 ROI on my Facebook post, which is great. But if that took 390 days to go to close, and you made a 2 to 1 ROI, I'm going to pick on Zillow on your Zillow, that took 90 days to go to close, you actually make more money from the velocity of money and the lower risk on that 90 day turn than you will in the 6 to 1 ROI. So when people say these things like, oh, you have a 2 to 1 ROI, I have a 6, it means nothing. Because if you don't put time in there, so the idea of tracking the time with your return on investment, you make better decisions, you make them faster, you lower your risk, and you can scale a lot faster with it. Paul, when you were on our show last, you were not kidding around that Chris has the, these crazy numbers just stuck up in his head. <laughs> I just told like, you to add though. I told you to take ads. That's what I'm saying. Like well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to get an agent to think about ROI, but you start. I mean, if you throw out a term like time preference of money, I think like just, like I, I could just I could hear people just shut down. But well, no, there's <laughs> little explosions everywhere. Their heads are. Yeah. Yeah. But I would argue 
it, this all this whole situation was created because people in real estate. I mean, and I was in real estate. Most salespeople are not analytics people. Most analytics people can't talk to a salesperson anyway. Those fall asleep. And so, <laughs> but you put those two things together, and the issue is all the software that's pretty much out there. Unless you're going to spend a quarter million dollars customizing Salesforce or Infusionsoft or something so high tech that salespeople aren't going to do it anyway. Yeah. But unless you do that, literally, if you have everything in one system and your leads are coming into one place. You're running your process in one place, and you just type in your spend in that one place. All that stuff's there for you to see anyway, and that's kind of what we, I used when I ran our business anyway. I custom built it because it's stuff that I'd used in other companies before. And in corporate America, you just do that. I mean, even that's come from corporate America, there's one system that runs everything. If you don't do that, I mean, it knows when you went to the restroom. Um, and so obviously, <laughs> we don't track that yet, but we probably will. Uh, but no, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just it's all in one spot. It's not hard to do, but it's impossible to do when you have all these different, little different systems trying to run everything. Right. It, okay. it is true. There, every time, I mean, I've always talked to all these great, you know, Matt and I have interviewed a lot of, you know, phenomenal companies, but they always go, here's my product, but check out my back end. I'm like, who gives a fuck about your back? Everyone's got to, now you have to do another <laughs> login. God damn it. And I'm going to lose it. And then I put it in a list, and then I can't remember where I put the list, and then I put a passcode on that list, and fuck. <laughs> yep. Uh, another piece I would say, and again, these are things that are just. <laughs> <laughs> Holy God. Okay. Um, oh, these, these are like agnostic. It doesn't matter what system. <laughs> so I can't stop laughing. Yeah. No. So what's this music? So I lost a ton of money in Ugh. real estate, um, and we lost it in four spots, and it was all about phone calls. So um, we made people call through a system, not an auto dialer. Um, call through a system that was right. a click to call system. When they made a call, the first interaction with a lead. So if an agent gets a lead, a telemarketer gets a lead, you have to call through the click to call until you make first contact. So I want to listen to that first phone call. I'm not going to listen to all of them. I'm going to listen to one every week with you during your one on one. And then we hand it to an agent. They would say, um, "Oh shoot, they really didn't want to meet, or they they didn't answer, or whatever." So let's listen to that phone call. I want to hear until you make contact. You're going to call through the system because you overqualified. You didn't say, "I'm just going to meet you there." Whatever the talk track was, you didn't follow it. And then we get fired from somebody when uh, we were on a with a listing. We get fired and say, "I haven't heard from my agent in three weeks." Well, in the system, it says you called every single week and it was a great conversation. If you didn't call through the system, it didn't happen. And then our past client calls. So it's kind of the idea if you step back and say, like, what are the worst things that can happen on any of these steps, and what could you build to fix it, or what could you have in place to fix it? That was kind of how we went at doing things. Um, and so there's things like that on lead routing and on accountability and on task management, on calling, on the ROI things. And that's where I would argue lead generation is great and very important. There's lots of ways you can do it yourself, and you can uh, so we could talk about that. But the lead protection, how much money people are losing today because of things that are already slipping through the cracks, that's kind of where we try and focus first. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, it's hard to keep. It's hard to be in both of those modes at once. Absolutely. Saving, yep. saving, and gaining. It, they're you know, like you have to set up your systems on the backside and then and like establish the controls in your business and then. And focus on like bringing more in, and that's where yeah, totally I think that's where most agents live, just in the mentality of bringing in, and then whatever goes out the back end is is just uh, ignored, I guess. So well, yeah, yeah, because uh, they don't want to be your failures naturally. Nobody does, but well, yeah, that, I mean, nobody wants to admit fail. that there's a, there's a lot of holes in the bottom of their bucket, right? Because yeah, that takes that takes time and discipline to fill up. Yeah, not mine. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Holes <laughs> <laughs> well, doesn't have a bucket. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> First problem: yeah, bucket. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Greg. So um, let's let's take a quick second and thank thank some people. And Greg, I'm sure you've got some shout outs. And then I want to dive into the bulk of it. We'll talk about the uh, the few main things that you should track as an agent. And we'll get into talking about uh, the AdWords and Facebook and how to actually max out your ROI, uh, which has to do with both getting more in, but also the the controls on the back end to make sure stuff isn't falling out the bottom of the bucket. So uh, first of all, just a quick thank you to Viral Marketing for helping make podcasts and hangouts like these happen. Uh, they do an amazing job with uh, Greg's East Bay Real Estate video blog, so you can go to Greg's Marketing Examples and see exactly what they do, including the email, the YouTube page, the blog, the whole nine. Uh, and then go check out Homing In, which is started by a couple of guys that have been on the podcast mm -hmm. before. Uh, it's essentially a place where homeowners can request valuations from actual agents in the area. It's free to download for both sides. So uh, there are not enough agents downloading the app to keep up with the home sellers, the homeowners that are downloading the app. So uh, go check that out, and there may actually be free seller lead in that app from, uh, from actual homeowners. So anyway. Yeah, I actually have a – I got a lead from Homing In. So nice. It, we're not lying to you. We, we do we do tell the truth most yeah. of the time. Yeah, and this is the, that's an interesting thing because so I mean, Chris, this is, I don't know if you've kept an eye on this, but I mean, if if a homeowner requests a valuation through an app, that app is going to have the ability to message with them. So it it 
from at least it seems to me from the outside looking in, it completely gets around all of those you know all of those regulations. If somebody wants to reach out, request evaluation from an agent, the agent provides that, and then the the homeowner follows up with a question. It's essentially like texting. The the agent just responds through the through the app, and it gets around all of that, right? Yeah, because if it's a, they're very specific that it's about using a mobile number, a text going to a mobile number. So if it's through an app process, I don't think that applies at all. Again, I'm not an attorney, but that doesn't involve a mobile number at all. Cool. Yeah. Well, that'd be awesome. So, sounds like that'll be untouched unless the government decides to shine its um, oh, purview onto when, that area. When they do? No. That's when? Yeah. yeah exactly. It's it's all right. All right, Matt. Greg, who do you have to shout out? I got a, a couple of awesome people. Um, so from YouTube, I have Remax Durban uh, Dolly. This Lexi is a bitch. Um, been watching our show for the last... Okay, dude, check this out, Matt. It's really cool, though. Um, they've been watching our show for the last several uh, several months. And I'm not going to say that it's from us, but this is really cool. They got seven listings this month when they only had four listings all last year. So I think we may be having some sort of effect on that. Paul's awesome. like, thumbs up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love you guys already. Um, well, thanks, buddy. It's mutual. <laughs> um, uh, but they, uh, they, I, I, I talked to them, him or her, it, they, whatever, because uh, I don't know wh who they are. But um, they, they're using the welcome to the neighborhood parties that I've talked about several times, or like yeah, leaving yeah. the area parties, and that's what's really been putting them on the map in the area. So, <laughs> knuckles to you. Um, last night, dude, I've been getting flaked on on my MCCs, and that's pissing me off. And so I didn't call you, Matt, because Neely picked up the phone. Um, as the president of our fan club, she gets the, you know the first rights uh, to get a phone call and do additional coaching. So got to talk to her, Neely. Great talking with you, um, Tita. is amazing talking with you a couple of nights ago. Really a lot of fun. Glad I gave you a call and reminded you after you got back from your vacation to get on the phone with me. <laughs> and then right now, Stevie from Florida is watching us while cooking and laughing out loud, you guys. So Stevie, thanks for watching us. That is amazing. And I'm glad we can bring a little education and humor. And by the way, the crock pot looks super good. And now, thanks to you, I'm starving. Okay, let's get back to real estate. <laughs> All right. So yes, and uh, so I think part of the problem we've talked about this before, Greg, with people, uh, you know, potentially flaking on you their their call with you is mm -hmm. you're booked out so far in advance. So like, set it up. Give Greg a call or a text, 925-915-1978. But just be aware, like, he's booked until, like, middle of August. August 17th. Uh, so for the love of God, like, set yourself a calendar reminder and make sure you show up to the call. Please, don't make me call, don't make me call Matt. Don't, yeah, nobody, his nobody girlfriend hates that shit. Okay. As well she should, for the love of God. <laughs> All right, Chris. And I don't want her to hate me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. You don't want a small blonde hating you. No, no, uh, no, wielding a big, <laughs> never mind. Can of Aquanet? Yes. <laughs> with a, like a lighter? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> All right, moving forward. We digress. All right, Chris. You know, nobody sent me the picture of your family. I was really happy. Oh, oh, oh what? Oh, you didn't see that come up on Facebook? No. Oh, you got to go check it out. Matt, Julian, oh, and Obese Babies. Oh, oh, i got to track on. it down. All right, so while I track that down and get that to Paul, Chris, let's go back to you. So what are, um, <laughs> for, for the average agent or team on the street, and, and a lot of this stuff is, is great if you're a team leader and you have a little bit more time to kind of pull back and really look at the big picture of things, but what are the three most important things that an agent or a team should be tracking that will actually give you information to make intelligent decisions? Yes, yeah, so I think... What's that, Paul? Were you answering that? Advil right now. Yeah. <laughs> Advil. No, I think... Uh, <clears throat> I think that's probably the three most important things. One would be process, and it's more of a general idea because you can do it in a lot of different places, but is there any single lead? And for me, a lead is a conversation. I don't care if it's your sphere, if it's something you bought, if it's a past client, it's the opportunity for a conversation. That's what we're here for is to generate conversations, mm -hmm. and then our either magnetic or non-magnetic personalities have different conversion rates. Um, but it's the process. Is there any lead anywhere in your system that doesn't have a task to follow up with someday in the future? Um, I don't care if it's two, day, two days out, if it's two years out, if it's 20 years out, it's like call them and see if they're dead yet. I mean, that's still a task. If not, I mean, why is it in your system? And so that's kind of one of the biggest things. If you could track how many leads don't have tasks, and that's really a question. So we do it on a standpoint of you can have multiple agents assigned, teams, lenders, whatever you want. But with that lead, is there anybody that's assigned to that lead that doesn't have a task? If so, why are they assigned to that lead in the first place? If they have no reason to touch it in the future, why are they even there? They should be somewhere else. And so um, that's one piece is, is there anything without a task? And that's, it could be an automated thing. It can be a call every three weeks. It can be check on them every six months, see if they're searching for homes, send them an updated home value. Just that idea of being able to step back, I'm going to look at my list. This is what I'm going to do. I know what I have to do every single day where all my pipeline is because there are too many leads 
in a system that don't have tasks and you don't know why they're there and you're, it's going to be a ball that's dropped. And everybody's had it where, oh, I called through 400 old leads and I found six people that already bought homes. Why? Because you didn't have any reason to follow up with them. You didn't have a task for yourself or you didn't have enough people. If you really have that many extra leads nobody can touch, bring a buyer's agent on and say, call these, you'll get X percent split with it, whatever that is. So that's why my number one is anything that doesn't have a task in it. Um, I think the number two is it would probably be the idea of safe searches. Um, and again, this is something very personal as far as uh, me. I don't care if you're using a past, it's giving out past values or home values, or if it's just something of having them on an MLS search. The things I don't like about MLS searches or other things is they shut off automatically after 60 days or 90 days if they don't click them. And so when you're saying, hey, I want to set somebody up, somebody, I talk to someone, they don't want to sell for two years, I don't care. Hey, would you like to just see what's going on in property values in your neighborhood once a month? You never have to talk to me again. Something to kind of get in that door and be able to see what their activity is. I mean, set them up on a once a month search in their neighborhood, what's going on. And so six months later, when you check on it, you see they're actually clicking on properties now, that's an engagement point. And so it's some reason to stay in front. We're in real estate. We're not in the, the bread baking business or sending recipes, even though that stuff can still be good. Um, and so getting those properties in front of them would probably be another one. I mean, if they're in your database, they should have a chance to get what's going on in their neighborhood once a month, uh, once every two months, whatever that is. Okay. So you're talking about a, a safe search in the sense of like a system like, uh, like either Firepoint or Boomtown, whatever the case is, going into your, going into your system, not the MLS, to set up their, their search. Yeah, and the only reason so I would say that, shutting off. yeah, is most MLSs, actually even other CRM systems out there, um, will automatically shut the shut those searches off. Even if they don't unsubscribe, if they don't click on it in 90 days, they'll shut it down. And that's kind of the issue. We watch more on a client-by-client -client basis what people's spam rates are and unsubscribes. We have conversations with our clients. We have no automated things that shut people off. We actually have that, that live conversation with them and talk to them about what's going on with their database, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, anything that auto shuts them off can be useless because if it shuts them off after three months, that wasn't the point. What, are you going to go set it up again every single mm -hmm. three months? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use a couple of other systems backends, and that's exactly what they do. So, I want to know more about kind of how you got get around that. I mean, what are you what are you, are you putting triggers sure. in for people to to call? I mean, or whatever. So, what our our piece is is if people agree to it. I mean, they agree to it. You talked to them and said, "Hey, do you want this?" And they said, "Yes." I mean, you said on the phone, they didn't want to talk to you, saying, hey, do you want to just do this uh, for the next, every month, you want to see what's going on with property values? They said yes, and you have that as a recorded call, whatever it is, they gave you permission for it. You're not now spam marketing them. And the other side is, um, some systems, like even very big CRMs, like massive worldwide CRMs, will shut you off if your spam rate goes over two in 10,000, or whatever those numbers are. Whereas we just do that a little differently. We watch on a per client basis, and we have a conversation, we try and figure out, are they mass spamming people, or was it three people opted out on the same day, and they it really is an average over three months instead of one month. So we control it on more of a relationship basis than a kind of a hardcore. And uh, can I do, I do want to do a plug, if I can, really quick on the viral side. Um, we work with Viral specifically, and I've worked with them before, even when I was in real estate, on like the campaigns and the introduction that they'll co they've come in for our clients and built entire like for sale by owner expired and video campaigns and all things that go along with those safe searches, because um, a lot of agents don't want to go through and do all of that work with it, so it automates even the video follow-up piece when leads are coming in from different places. Really? But that plays into yeah, yeah it's because it, you have a lead that comes in from say Zillow, which all, everything drops in from one place, and all of a sudden the the video goes out, and then an email goes out, and then there's a task to call, and then four days later your next video video goes out. And so you build kind of like these video follow-up sequences, which have a lot higher click-through rates and engagement. If they see it's a 30-second video, then obviously reading a two-page text email. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just that's a whole different side on the automation piece. Yeah, that's for, any, for anybody that's not familiar like for, with the way viral works, that would be considered like an extra strategy. It's not part of the core marketing plan, but once you get in and if you're actually following through and you're consistent with the normal stuff, there is an incredible amount of stuff that can drop on you uh, and, and do like one, one extra thing every month and those, uh, those kind of uh, automated campaigns are one of them. That's one of the highest value things you can do. Um, I've been a viral client for like two plus years and this is the first time hearing of this. <laughs> what hey, in the enough. hell? <laughs> You're probably not a Firepoint client, so no, <laughs> not, a, not not until later today. <laughs> uh, Greg, fair enough. For uh, God's sake, you've been keeping me in the dark, Johnson. Uh -huh. uh, probably. <laughs> All right. So that was that was number two, right? Two. The safe searches was two out of the yeah. three top things, right? Yep. Um, yep. Number three for me would be if you don't know what your return on investment is, and to me, return on investment it means dollar and time. If you don't know that, don't spend more money on things. I mean, you can still spend money. There are obviously a lot of very profitable agents out there that do it the way they've always done it and they're profitable with it. But I would argue their profitability could double in a year if they're going to go through and track things the right way. Because if they find out 
they say, oh, I spent $60,000 last year on this and I made 122 to 1 ROI. But if they had something else that maybe they got a 2 to 1 ROI but it was in 3 months instead of 12 months, that will make them 4 or 5, 6 times more money if they reallocate that spend. Um, and so the kind of the profitability piece, it might be as simple as a spreadsheet. It can be an integrated system where it's all trapped in one place. But it's that idea, when somebody says, Again, people throw stuff out, I have a 12 to 1 ROI. Well, was that before you paid agents? Was that after you paid agents? Because is that after you paid the lead source? Because if you say I have a 6 to 1 ROI, is that after you paid the $1,000 for the lead source, that was what was left over? And people compare numbers and they get their ego hit, and obviously we all like to say how big our numbers were. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of times we're talking a whole different language. We're not talking about the same thing. So trying to figure out, like somebody gets off a blog and they're like, oh shoot, that guy is 6 to 1, I only have a 2 to 1, what am I doing wrong? I'm going to cancel it. That 2 to 1 might actually be better numbers than that 6 to 1 because they're talking about two different things. So really understanding what they're spending, how long is it taking them to convert, and then what they're actually making back on it to make better decisions with it. Hmm. Well, I think that goes back to the fact that unless you've... Like Chris, you've got an interesting background, and I think you probably—I don't know—not that you come to this naturally, but you come into real estate from a different background. People that come into real estate typically don't have the mentality of looking at things in terms of, "I am running a professional service firm. Yeah. I am investing, you know, time to build skills and expertise, and I expect a return on my investment of time and money." So that they view—they view their time as free. And then the money as this huge, you know, thing that they, they try to save as much of it. It's it's the opposite of the way a business person would look at it. A business person would come into a professional service firm and go, look, we're investing two things, money and time, yeah. and we need to get a return on that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, so it's a there's a lot of mindset stuff that goes along with that. That I think the average agent just they don't. It all goes back to not looking at at real estate as a business. I mean, Jeff pointed Jeff Cohn pointed this out. Um, so the whole rainmaker model of teams, like if you if you looked at it as an actual business and you took out the personal commission of the rainmaker that's at the center center of the business, the actual business might not even be profitable. It's actually running at a loss to support the agent's lifestyle. So like this whole thing goes back to not not running things as a business. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's a really good point uh, when you look at how things are running. And most people, like if they say, well, for sale by owners and expires, which I made a lot of money on, um, and I love it, but if for sale by owners and expires, for me, we're free because it's just a telemarketer. Well, no, that telemarketer's salary, or if I'm doing it, am I paying myself a wage? That should go as my expense for FISBO yeah. expired because I could be doing something else. I could be door knocking. I could be taking time off. I could be doing something else for lead generation. So even your time, putting that as an expense and tracking that, you're right. I mean, that's not the normal mindset. And I'm not going to definitely argue against any coaching or anything else out there, but I think it's a missing piece that a lot of people don't coach down that expense road for tracking it. It's just looking at the actual dollar spent in the income versus the other pieces of it. And right. that's yeah. about the rainmaker hit me in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> three years ago when no three years ago when I pulled out my production from our team, man, it was ugly. And yeah. you're absolutely right. You really have to have a better system in place than we did. Sure wish Firepoint was around three years ago. That would have been awesome. Thanks, Chris. But you're, but yeah, you're, you're turning welcome. around now, Paul. What's that? But you're turning around now, right? Oh, yeah, no, this has been a great year, and our team's been doing doing really well. But I'm telling you, that first year, man, that when you said that, I got, like, flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> PTSD of uh, real estate lead gen. Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, oh, but no. the thing is, is that, I mean, that's... I, I think everybody goes through that transition, right? I mean, if you're... And I'm sure, Chris, you can see this in the entrepreneurial world or the software world. I mean, it, it's not quite the same as a sales team, but everybody goes through that area where the the entrepreneur is the rainmaker, bringing the sales in, and then you got to figure out like how to extract that rainmaker from from the process if it's going to be a real firm that that grows and and thrives on its own. I mean, it's so it's a process that we all go through. You can look back in hindsight and and get the chills about it, but it's it's still a process that we all have to go through. We don't get to being the team leader unless that the gets to withdraw from the business unless you come into the business with a million dollars. No, it hurt. It hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I, I mean, to your point there, I would argue that if you didn't go through that process, you probably don't respect it enough and respect yes. it what it is. So you right. come into it with a million dollars. You see people, millionaires will come in and lose all their money because they didn't respect the right pieces in the right, right. place. So... Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's one of those people could talk about it ahead of time, and you can kind of like give them ideas on how to walk through it differently, or everybody goes through it, and some people just don't recover. Yeah, it's probably one of the most eye-opening experiences of, of our business, actually. So, as much as I like to cry about it, yes, it was it was probably better in the long term. Thank yeah. you for making me feel better, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Well, because <laughs> so yeah, and just to further make you feel better, I I interviewed a guy who is a high-level recruiting coach, and he worked with a lot of clients 
who were members of Management Recruiters International, which is a franchise organization that would teach somebody how to come into the recruiting business, hire four people, essentially salespeople, and start an office right off the bat. And you know which people failed? The people that couldn't, the people that were trying to manage and hire salespeople who couldn't sell themselves. Sure. Okay. So okay. his his job in the recruiting industry was he would work with those guys that had floundering or flatlining recruiting operations, which essentially would be like a real estate expansion team. And he was having to go back to the person that was managing the office and had recruited those recruiters and teach them how to do cold call sales because they couldn't manage other people to do it without having done it themselves. It was a really super, super interesting. I like that. Um, okay, so let's get back into the, like the the ROI conversation. So let's say let's say you install some better tracking. You have you have some good tracking in place, so you're making better decisions, right? Yeah. Um, I've been talking a lot a lot with Jeff Cohn about this. Um, maybe it's a, a selfish question, but I know a lot of people want to know the answer to it too, from your perspective, which is Google AdWords versus Facebook. First of all, it, like it, not necessarily what's different or better, but sure. when somebody looks at whether to invest their money in one or the other, what what are some of the things that the the best agents around the country are doing that are that is working, and why is that, and what what's the if you're going for like buyers or sellers, is there a certain one that's better for one or the other? Great question. So obviously, personal opinions here um, from my personal experience as well. Um, when you look at just the what goes on behind somebody's uh, eyes when they're actually clicking on something, uh, you go to AdWords, and we say AdWords, you're talking about being Yahoo, Google, wherever a search traffic you can target a term, and you're getting somebody that's searching for something very specific. They're taking the time to go and type in, "I'm looking for a home in Castrock. I'm looking for a town home in Cherry Creek." So it's a very targeted search. There's more intention there. If you throw a pretty picture of a car up in front of somebody and say, do you, do you know, want to know what your car is worth? A lot of people are going to say yes, and some are going to have the intention of selling their car. Some didn't think they had the intention. Once they find out how much it's worth, make go to sell their car, but a lot of them did not have that intention. And so if you look at lead generation from the standpoint of, I just want to pulse a name and a number and a reason to call, because that's a conversation, the Facebook can work incredibly well. It's usually a much lower cost, but you're usually getting a lower level of engagement, not as targeted. Um, you can target different ways. I mean, you get down to, I want somebody from 27 to 29 that thinks they're going to move in the next six months, and they have this, and they just had a kid. I mean, you can go through those types of targeting pieces, but the thing about that I personally like about AdWords, I don't care if you run it yourself, however you do it, you can get very targeted to price points. There was one year we increased our buy side price point by 30% just by changing the area we were targeting our pay-per-click to. So it's not saying, hey, I want to run pay-per-click in all of Denver. It's no. I want to run pay-per-click in Douglas County. I don't want condos there because they're too low price in that area. I want to run Cherry Creek and Wash Park, and you target very specific areas, so you're controlling your price point of who's looking in certain areas. When I was in the business, we found that 38% of all of our appointments that came from buyer forced registration pay-per-click leads were actually seller appointments. And Boston Logic just re released a long-term study that had 42% of all of their pay-per-click leads were sellers or had a house to sell. So again, um, when you're looking at pay-per-click, they're usually 12 to 18 months out. They're far enough out, they usually don't have a relationship with an agent, so it's a great source of the seller opportunities as well. Um, so they're really looking at different things. Do you want conversations that might be farther out, might have a little less of a commitment level, or do you want what's usually a more expensive, very targeted price point lead that's coming through from AdWords. Yeah, it's, and it reminds me of the uh, the Facebook post that Greg, you and I were making fun of on the last show with uh, with Aaron Wittenstein. <laughs> Somebody posted in the Facebook group, and I don't remember which it was. Uh, I can't remember which group it is now. Offhand, but essentially the post was this: Where can I go to generate buyer leads that that are ready to go right now? I don't have the time to nurture internet leads. <laughs> which I was. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, it made me laugh out loud in the TSA line of an airport. I, I just I, I couldn't I couldn't help myself. But I mean that that is I, that's like the holy grail. I mean if you can figure out how to do that, that that lead is worth a lot. And then you have you have varying degrees of like Google AdWords and Facebook and stuff like that. But uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. So if, if you have Facebook ads coming in, if you're going to use that as a way to generate leads, you have to plan on that taking a little bit more time to nurture, right? Absolutely, and that's all expectations. If you go into it saying, I know on average this might take me 24 months, and you're always going to find some that's, that are sooner, some that are later, mm -hmm. um, and go into it with the expectation that when, I mean, even the phone script from, I'm going to pick on Zillow, a phone script from a Zillow lead to a home valuation lead to a buyer pay per click lead, those are very different scripts of how you're following up, how you're building a relationship. And again, most of them are just trying to open the conversation up and get people to volunteer and not being uh, too aggressive until long term when you're really following up with them. Uh, but yeah, very different follow up plans, very different automation you might be doing with them, what you're 
going to be sending out. The even the the scripts as far as what you're sending out in emails and what you're saying on voicemails and all of those are different processes for each one. But I think the AdWords piece is kind of misunderstood. They're like, well, those are trash leads. I mean, for me personally, if I can make a six to one or ten to one ROI over twelve to eighteen months and have forty percent of those be sellers, that to me is great. But it's a long term play, so it really depends yeah. what you're looking for in your business. Yeah. Well, everybody's looking for the you know the 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 golden you know parachute you know the easy button you can push and you just get instant gratification. Because life's so, that way, yeah. Right. Because also we have we have brains like goldfish and you know it's like and we can't remember you know oh I bought this because I saw these long term results oh wait it, it didn't work in two weeks oh I'm, I'm trashing it you know yeah. so what is your antidote? I think the antidote for us, uh, for me, is relationships and coaching. I mean, we're not a coaching organization, so we recommend everybody has some type of a coach or somebody to go to that holds them accountable to that. I mean, I think everybody needs accountability. I mean, we get into this business because we usually hate it. We don't want to work for anybody, and that's what we actually needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having somebody to kind of walk you through. And then the idea of a system of accountability, that if you have a system that for this lead is uh, whatever it is, is telling you to call on day six and it sends an email, call on day 12 and then this and call on six months and then check to see what they're doing. And if you have a coach that's looking at that also, they're going to say, dude, you're failing. You spent $20,000 here. You're not respecting this. Get somebody to follow up on it for you. And so really that accountability even into the system you're using, that somebody looks at that and says, here's the areas that you're screwing up on or why are you still spending money on this? It says that your ROI is lower than here. Why are you doing that? But people get emotionally attached to stuff and they want to keep doing it because their friend works at that company or because this was really great for them two years ago. So that outside accountability I think is huge. Yeah, it really is, and it better not be your spouse. There's enough stress in that relationship anyways, okay? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what you want to hear right before we go to bed. Is, uh, Matt, we're, I'm really concerned. I want to have a conversation about a Google AdWords budget. Yeah, let's talk about your cash conversion cycle. Yeah, that, that's yeah. great. Oh, exactly. Yeah, nothing yeah. Gets, the, gets the juices flowing than cash conversion cycle. You talk dirty to me. ROI? Ooh. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. Okay, so, so accountability... That's good. All right. So th those are we've got some good takeaways for the average agent or team, which is there's a few simple things you can put in place to track, and then get your accountability in place. Um, work with uh, with either viral or somebody that can help you get some really good lead follow up content in place. Sounds like that's a pretty good uh, part of your system, Chris. You have going is when if you if you go in knowing you have this long term investment in a certain type of lead, how almost half of them are seller leads, which is ridiculous. People don't realize. Um, Really, then it just comes down to, okay, if I'm going to make a commitment to this, I have to, and I think, I can't remember who was it that said this, Greg, was it, um, was it Chris Smith that said, uh, if you're going to commit to uh, 10x follow-up, you, uh, you have to have 10x reasons to follow up. I think it was Chris. I think it was Chris. Yeah. yeah he went on so, Howard, uh, Tyree, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's about having the. I think that's where most agents fall down on this, is they go, yeah, 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 I understand that most sales happen between the seventh and the twelfth call. But what the hell do I talk about after the second call? You know, and How, that's where you have to get some education and content and training. And well, that's where you know that that goes back to building the relationship using the Ford script, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Being in, genuinely interested in them and their lives. You know, being a service provider, being a problem solver. You know, be be their go-to resource for everything, anything. You know, real estate to start off, and then for anything down the road, be the person. You're, be their own personal Google. If you can ever get to that level, because then you can talk about anything under the sun. N nothing's ever really going to be out of the realm of uh, a p uh, possibility to, to talk about, because yeah. you're, you're the go-to. Yeah. Hey, but most people don't think about it like that. They think about it just real estate or just whatever. When in reality, you know, if I wanted to talk to Paul about something or, or Chris about something, I can ask him about something. You know, whatever. whatever well, yeah, I and I think, and Chris, we can talk about this because this is an interesting conversation to have. So, <clears throat> when I look at, there's a really good book called Scale by Jeff Hoffman. Have you read that yet? I've not. No. Okay, it's it's ridiculously good. But in other words, he gives this kind of a um, almost a framework for how any business is, is grown, where you start off in, I think they're divided up into four stages, but essentially the, the takeaway is, look, you're going to start off in like, you need to figure out your lead gen and your operations kind of at the same time. Those are the, the stages that everybody's in. And um, when you're first starting out a business, you're going to be in kind of the hustle stage. You're having personal conversations, you're working the, your relationships that you already have, you're trying to work your relationships to meet new people in your extended network and you kind of get things established, right? Then you can look at systematizing your lead generation. What I think a lot of agents do is they look at lead generation systems as a shortcut around the hustle. Yeah, and that totally does not work, and I agree. And so no. I, there's another book, it's called Zero to One, which has a very similar message. And it talks about staying attached to the process until you can't. 
I mean, you have to let it go. But so many people in real estate, again, that easy button, they want to say, oh, if I just pay this money, that'll go away and business will just come in. And no, it's the personal element is there. Even like on the recruiting process, like I made mistakes on this personally, where agents came to work for me, not for my CRM, not for my system, not for my leads. And I mean, they came to work for me. And so if I pulled away too fast in that recruiting or the training or holding the company meetings or whatever that was, even that breaks down. And so it's one of those that you start systematizing too early and you make it too impersonal. And at that point, I mean, you, you're you going to create what you are. And so you're going to train people to handle it that way. And at the end of the day, I love that script. I mean, it's about people. And these are all conversations. And you find the people that are willing to talk to you. And those are your clients forever. And that's where, I mean, the referrals, everything we do, it's not about just turn on lead generation, scale it, buy another system. I mean, that will only last so long. And the people that keep those relationships in a bad market, I mean, really quick on that buyer lead generation side, People are searching buyer lead generation houses to buy houses. So you go into a market that's ultra competitive like Boulder here where there's three homes on the market. Do you think buyer home search sites are generating any traffic today? No, because no one's going to register to look at three homes. And so when you talk about weathering a market, it's all about people. It's not about the legion because the legion will change depending on the market you're in. No, I completely hmm. agree with you. Absolutely 100% agree with you. By, by the way, that zero to one book is phenomenal. Nice. Yep, absolutely. Really enjoy that book. So in, in the last few minutes that we have left, what are some? Give us some things that uh, that agent or especially team can look at ways that they are losing profitability in their in their lead gen spend, where they can uh, maybe plug some holes in the bottom of their bucket. You know, I think uh, the number one piece on the spend, I would look at how much money you're making for what you're already spending. Like, don't go spend more. Um, if you can't say, here's what my ROI is over the last six months or nine months or 12 months, you've got to figure that out. And that doesn't have to be a super complicated thing. And if you can't say, hey, I'm going to pick my last 75 leads, maybe the leads that came in last year, I'm going to see when the close dates were, how long an average did they take to close? Because you start putting those two pieces together, my return, my expense compared to my income and the time together, it tells you a whole different picture than just looking at that ROI. Another one would be, is there anything in my database, like we said before, anybody in my database that doesn't have a task to follow up? And if so, does that mean I need more people? Doesn't mean you have to pay them, put them on commission. I mean, there's ways to deal with stuff. Um, are you holding people accountable? How big is each person's pipeline? If you have an agent with 2,000 leads they're following up with, are they really following up that well? Or could somebody else follow up? Is there money just sitting there? And we all know they're doing transactions. And then I hit on constantly that call recording piece. I mean, obviously you have to understand if you're in a two-party notification or one-party recording state, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the end of the day, if you can't listen to a phone call, why would you generate a lead if you can't listen to it and coach them through that first phone call? Because that phone call is the make or break for everything. And we would love to hand that off. No salesperson wants to sit down and listen to every phone call. I would never advocate that. But if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one with an agent or every week, every month, and just listening to one phone call, it'll drive you insane. But you'll find ways to fix things when they're, how to, when they're held accountable to it. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's that's something I've got to take back to uh, to Jeff Cohn and, and the team there in, in Nebraska and get them to start implementing that. I, they have one of the best, I, th I think, one of the best agent accountability systems in place, but that's one piece they don't have is the call recording and review, which is, I mean, that's coming from our background in, you know, like my background in corporate training and insurance. I mean, I've, I've done that. I understand the value of it. I mean, it, it genuinely helps people get better at their job, so there's yeah. no reason we shouldn't be doing that. PowerPoint automatically does that for you? What? It does. Paul? Do you say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Very cool. Okay, so real quick, so Chris, how do they how do they get how do they get more information? How do they take a step toward FirePoint to learning more about you guys? Yeah, everything's just on the website, firepoint.net. The demo schedule's there, you pick your own time, the information's there, our pricing's there. I mean, we're very open about what we do. If we're great for you, great. If we're not, great. I mean, at the end of the day, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing and we'll fit for some people. Yeah, very cool. All right, so well, just do you want to talk about who your ideal client is? Yeah, our ideal client is, uh, I'd probably say anywhere from, I mean, we have single agents all the way up to teams of 60, 75 offices. Wow. I think our ideal client really understands the pain of having multiple systems and the pain points of tracking stuff they normally can't see. Because most salespeople, they're really going to use one system well. They might tack other ones on, but they're not going to use them well. And so they're really just understanding the pain of having different systems, and they're managing some sort of a team. Single agent that's totally okay with a notepad or sticky notes and doesn't to log into a computer, that is not our ideal client. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're out there. No, there's though, no so. amount of training videos and hand holding that can help that situation. Nope. <laughs> All right. And then, Paul, remind us uh, where you're at and how people can send referrals to your team because you've got a couple of different uh, teams in different areas. Yeah, no, uh, we're in the Portland, Oregon market, which includes all of the surrounding areas like Tiger and Beaverton and Sandy and, and all. There's plenty of them. We're also in the Bend, Oregon market, which is kind of our, our little high desert vacation community, beautiful place. Uh, and you can find us at uh, StellarNW.com or PortlandPropertyFinders.com or BendPropertyFinders.com. And anybody's welcome to hit me up on my cell phone or my personal email. 
which is Paul C at StellarRealtyNW.com. Yeah, and uh, we kind of uh, we didn't mean to intentionally ignore you, but obviously Chris had some amazing value That's to share, which fun. is why he introduced us in the first place. But for anybody that that is interested, you can go back and listen to Paul's episode from a few weeks ago, where we dived into like his teams, his average workday, how he oversees the investment. Uh, side of things while still managing a couple of brokerage offices and recruiting agents and all that stuff. So that's a really good interview. Go back and listen to that from a few weeks uh, from a few weeks ago. I'm just and, thrilled with the trip today. It's all good. Yes. I knew that was <laughs> you can fill up more than an hour. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, we could seriously talk about this for like another three or four hours. It's oh, really, yeah. really interesting stuff, especially from the the team perspective. So we'll have to get you back and uh, and talk about maybe some mindset issues and uh, and how you know. Teams, I think, can be better at tracking and how they can look at ROI better to make sure that they have a good, solid, uh, stable business. So it's going to be interesting how things shake out over the next year or two as we might experience a correction and some of these things that we're used to or have gotten accustomed to over the last five, six, seven years of real estate since the last correction. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how much stuff stands. You know what we Great. know what we should do. You know what we should do. I just came up with the most perfect idea to get, get you guys back on. You guys will let me try Firepoint out at no cost to demo it down here in the Bay Area, and then we can come back with all the results, and that will be a, that will be a perfect way, don't you think? Done. How about I fly out there, and we Ooh. implement it for your, for your team, and we help you see what you can't see right now, and then you give your honest feedback. Now we're talking. Done. Boom, done. <laughs> you know I'm coming, right? Yeah, no, Paul can't, Paul can't be down. there. No, Paul cannot be there. Paul, what? Can't. I thought Paul was bringing the we'll drinks. We'll get no work done. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, well, he's he, he <laughs> beer. Come on. <laughs> That's right. Paul just shows up with like a keg strapped to his shoulder. <laughs> Let's so, do this, people. <laughs> That's right. All right, guys. So, uh, Greg, real quick, remind people, uh, refresh people on the McDaniel Challenge and how to reach you. It's a magical moment when you and I get to spend some time together, you know, talking late, late, late in the evening. Uh, all about nothing but good real estate. No, okay, it's going to stop being weird. Um, it's going to be a time, an hour and a half to two hours. You guys are going to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. It's a private, free, no obligations um, you know, coaching call. We're going to take you, you know, mind, mental mindset, marketing, farming, prospecting, whatever is you know, getting in your way from stopping from being the, the, the agent that you want to be. Um, and just getting to hang out, man. We're going to have a couple of beers. Just kick back and relax and hang out. My next date is, I should have had this ready, but I don't, so you're going to have to wait. Um, I believe it is August, nope, September, a little too far, McDaniel. Uh, it's going to be the 18th. Wow. Okay. It is going to be the 18th of August is my next time. Guys, call me on this thing. It's a phone. It's sell, I pay it every month. It works. It's my cellular telephone, 925-915-1978, again, 925-915-1978. cellular telephone? Did, did, it come, did it come in a bag? This big, yes. looks like a box. <laughs> Call from an auto dialer, please. Big, oh yeah, yeah auto exactly. dialer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Call me from an auto dialer. Feel free dialer. to sign Greg up for some auto dialers from some <laughs> disreputable companies. So let's, let's, <laughs> let's sue them. Come on, let's make some money, people. I That's probably right. need a new pair of shoes. Call me from an auto dialer. Hey. Guys, I appreciate it. Shit, I just hit my phone way too hard. Um, what an awesome interview with you guys today. Super, super yeah. awesome. Incredible data. Um, I really appreciate you guys listening to everything I had to say. Thank you. You were, you were great, Paul. You were great. Attention. You're here for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing what you had to share. It was really yeah, cool. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, right. I'll reach out. We'll schedule for me to jump down to the Bay Area, and we'll go from there. Good. Cool. Uh, you're, wait, you're being serious? I thought you were fucking with me. No, I'm 100% serious. <laughs> oh, dude. No, it's even cool. Yes. cool. Done. <laughs> sure, <All right>. yes. <laughs> All right. We are, uh, for everybody that's still watching live, just thank you so much. We are back on Friday with Aaron Wittenstein. We're going to be talking more about objection, objection handlers and maybe doing some role play as well between him and Greg on all yep. kinds of scripts and stuff like that. So until then, everybody, we will see you guys then.